video is about the chaotic life of pop icon Edie Sedgwick. Known for both her beauty and her personal demons, Edie Sedgwick shot to fame as an actress with Andy Warhol's Superstars before dying at 28 in 1971. From the outsides, she seemed to have it all. Beautiful, rich, and a muse to Andy Warhol, she lived a life that many can only dream about, but her inner darkness ran deep. Her beauty and infectious energy masked great tragedy. Sedgwick had suffered an abusive, isolated childhood and struggled frequently with mental illness, eating disorders, and drug abuse. Like a lit match, she burned brilliantly but briefly. By the time she tragically died at the age of 28, she had posed for Vogue, inspired Bob Dylan songs, and starred in over a dozen Warhol films. From fame to tragedy, this is the story of Edie Sedgwick. Born on April 20th, 1943 in Santa Barbara, California, Edith Minturn Sedgwick came from a long line of prominent Americans. But as her 19th century ancestor, Henry Sedgwick noted, depression was the family disease. She came of age on a 3,000 acre cattle ranch in Santa Barbara called Corral de Quati under the thumb of her icy father, Francis Minturn Duke Sedgwick. Once cautioned from having children because of his struggles with mental illness, Francis and his wife had eight. Edie was the seventh of eight children of Alice Delano de Forest, who was born in 1908 and lived until 1988 and Francis, who was born in 1904 and lived until 1967. Francis was a rancher and sculptor and a member of the historical Sedgwick family of Massachusetts, which is also connected to the Peabody family, which has funded libraries around the country. Sedgwick's mother, Alice, was the daughter of Henry Wheeler de Forest, the president and chairman of the board of the Southern Pacific Railroad. She was named after her father's aunt, Edith Minturn Stokes, who was famously painted with her husband, Isaac, Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes, by Gilded Age artist, John Singer Sargent. Ironically, Edith Minturn Stokes is also pictured at the front as a sort of muse for Sargent in that portrait. The children were largely left to their own devices in Santa Barbara. Edie and her sisters made up their own games, roamed the ranch alone, and even lived in a separate cabin from their parents. We were taught in a weird way, recalled Edie's brother Jonathan, so that when we got out into the world we didn't fit anywhere. Nobody could understand us. Her childhood was also marked by sexual abuse. She later claimed her father first tried to sleep with her when she was seven years old. One of her brothers also allegedly propositioned her, telling Edie a sister and brother should teach each other the rules and the game of making love. We see this incest repeatedly in noble families, including the infamous Lord Byron. Edie's childhood fractured in more ways than one. She developed eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia. And when she walked in on her father with another woman, he responded by hitting her giving her tranquilizers and telling her, you don't know anything, you're insane. When she turned 18, her grandfather died and she began boarding at the Branson School near San Francisco. According to her older sister, Alice Saucy Sedgwick, she was soon taken out of the school because of her eating disorder, which was a series of binging and purging. Her father, worried about her health, severely restricted her freedom when she returned home. Soon afterwards, her parents shipped her off to a psychiatric hospital called Silver Hill in Connecticut. However, here her problems seemed to worsen. After dropping to 90 pounds, she was sent to a closed ward where she lost her will to live. I was very suicidal in a blind kind of way, Edie later said. I was starving to death just because I didn't want to turn out like my family showed me. I didn't want to live. At the same time, Edie had begun to experience life outside of her family dynamic. While in the hospital, she started a relationship with a Harvard student, but this too was imbued with darkness. After losing her virginity to him, she got pregnant and had an abortion. I could get an abortion without any hassle at all, just on the grounds of a psychiatric case, she recalled. So it wasn't too good a first experience with lovemaking. I mean, it kind of screwed up my head for one thing. 
If you are interested in abortions and stories of women who have had abortions, you can check out the videos on my channel dedicated to abortions in Golden Hollywood. Edie left the hospital and enrolled at Radcliffe, Harvard's College for Women, in 1963. There, she, beautiful, waif-like, and vulnerable, made an impression on her classmates. One remembered every boy at Harvard was trying to save Edie from herself. In the autumn of 1963, Sedgwick moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and began studying sculpture with her cousin, the artist Lily Saarinen. According to Saarinen, Sedgwick was very insecure about men, although all the men loved her. During this period, she partied with members of an elite bohemian fringe of the Harvard social scene. She was deeply affected by the loss of her older brothers, Francis Jr., known as Minty, and Robert, known as Bobby, who died within 18 months of each other. Francis had a particularly unhappy relationship with their father, who they called Fuzzy, suffered several breakdowns, eventually dying by suicide in 1964 while committed at Silver Hill Hospital, the same place Edie had been committed. Her second oldest brother, also suffered from mental health problems and died when his motorcycle crashed into the side of a New York City bus on New Year's Eve 1965 after suffering a nervous breakdown. In 1964, Edie made her way to New York City after turning 21 and receiving 80 grand from her maternal grandmother in a trust, but tragedy dogged her there too. Uh, her brother Minty, who had died, did so by hanging himself after confessing his homosexuality to their father. Despite these home issues, she seemed to fit in well with the energy of 1960s New York. Very thin, she had all of the city in the palm of her hand, having known several artists from her days at Radcliffe. In 1965, Edie met Andy Warhol. On March 26th, she met him at Tennessee Williams' birthday party. It wasn't a chance encounter. Movie producer Lester Persky had nudged the two together, recalling that when Andy first saw a picture of Edie, Andy sucked in his breath and said, oh, she's so beautiful, making every single letter in beautiful sound like a whole syllable. Warhol later described Eddie, Edie as so beautiful but so sick, adding, I was really intrigued. He suggested Edie come to his studio, The Factory, at East 47th Street in Midtown Manhattan, and when she stopped by that April, he gave her a small role in his all-male film, Vinyl. Edie's part was all of five minutes and involved smoking and dancing with no dialogue, but it was captivating. Just like that, Edie Sedgwick became Warhol's muse. She cut her hair and dyed it silver to match Warhol's iconic look. Meanwhile, Warhol cast her in film after film, eventually making 18 with her. She had her own brand of creativity she brought to Warhol films. She once designed an entire set of heart-shaped furniture for her bedroom. She wore children's skirts as her own, establishing the mini skirt trend, and her fashion with large ear earrings, leotards, and black tights became normal to see around New York she became a very fashionable asset to the Andy Warhol brand. Edie brought Andy out, the poet and Warholian circulator Rene Ricard said. She turned him on to the real world. Despite this influence, she was barely mentioned in the recent Netflix documentary on Warhol. Think about how liberating it must have been Edie's sister, Alice Sedgwick Wool writes, for Andy, shy and socially insecure as he was, to go about with a beautiful, sought-after girl who looked like a glamorous version of him, both incredibly thin and silver-haired. Warhol understood the power of repetition. He knew that a dolled-up Campbell's soup can could be reproduced into infinity. In Sedgwick, he made a repetition of himself, a doppelganger, who could accompany him out into the world to perform as part of his artist as the art shtick. You could argue that their relationship was all a piece of his work, but that ignores the human component of Edie Sedgwick. Warhol embraced the idea of their symbiosis. 
He knew that this sexier, less stilted version of himself, an awkward son of working class Eastern European immigrants in Pittsburgh, a sickly misfit, and the loneliest, most friendless person that playwright Truman Capote said he'd ever seen in his life, would more than double his presence in the art world. Warhol did not hesitate to take advantage of Edie's beauty. Warhol wished to replicate her effortless beauty, her genteel pedigree, and most of all, her ability to be completely at ease and in command in any situation. What Warhol did was recognize that Edie was this amazing creature, and he was able to make her more Edie, so that when he got it on camera, it, she would be made available to everybody. This pressure and intensity was exhausting. Warhol's movies captured Sedgwick just being herself, but involved a very intimate look at her, putting on makeup, lying in bed, perching on a couch arm while looking about the room. She appeared in his film's face, a 70 minute long close up, and Afternoon, a scripted chamber opera in which Sedgwick and friends gas around in her apartment high on amphetamines. Sedgwick Wall, who has spent decades watching her sister on film, observes her, observes her as if looking through a high-powered telescope. What they saw in Edie was not talent, but simply the way she was transcribed onto the screen. Sedgwick Wall writes, What you're seeing when you're looking at Edie Sedgwick is this lost piece of genteel Americana. But it was outside the conventional bounds of art that Sedgwick bounced her most flattering light back onto Warhol. When they appeared on the Merv Griffin show, Warhol wouldn't talk. He's not used to making really public appearances, Sedgwick explained, and whispered his answers to Griffin's questions into her ear. Sedgwick sat next to Griffin, entirely unfazed, responding to the host's entreaties in her delicate, flute-like New England voice, as if the two of them were merely giggling in private. At one point, she removed a shoulder-grazing earring, repaired it gracefully, and slid it back into her ear, all while she explained how a Campbell's soup can heightens our understanding of art. If you begin seeing it on canvases, you start thinking about it, what do we have around us all the time? What do you see the most of? She asked. Warhol could dwell among the fabulous without giving away too much of the self that he saw as ugly and awkward. Sedgwick could swan around as a pretty version of him, but she was more than that. He saw her as a breathy intoxication representation of the life as art he wanted to usher in in the 1960s. In Edie's first film, Vinyl, this was Warhol's interpretation of a clockwork orange. She also made a small cameo appearance in another film, Horse. Her appearances in both films were brief, but generated enough interest that Warhol decided to cast her in the starring role of his next films. The first of these avant-garde films, Poor Little Rich Girl from 1965, was originally conceived as part of a series of films featuring Sedgwick called the Poor Little Rich Girl Saga. The series was to include Poor Little Rich Girl, Girl Restaurant, Face, and Afternoon. Filming of Poor Little Rich Girl began in March 1965 in Sedgwick's apartment. It depicted her going about her daily routines. Sedgwick's next film for Warhol was Kitchen, which was filmed in May 1965 but not released until 1966. Written by Factory scriptwriter Ronald Tavel, the film stars Sedgwick, Rene Ricard, Roger Trudeau, Donald Lyons, and Electra. After Kitchen, Chuck Wine replace, replaced Ronald Tavel as a writer and assistant director for the filming of Beauty No. 2 of 1965, which premiered in July. The film shows Sedgwick lounging on a bed in her underwear, with Gino Pissericho and being taunted by Chuck Wine off screen. Warhol's, Warhol's films were for the most part shown only in underground film theaters and in viewings held at the factory in New York City and were not commercially successful. Regardless, the underground film theater was upstream of the mainstream media, so Cedric began receiving attention from the mainstream media, who reported on her appearances in the films and on her personal style. 
During this period, she developed the distinct look, including black leotards, mini dresses, large chandelier earrings, and heavy makeup. Warhol dubbed Sedgwick his superstar, and they began appearing together at various public events. Sedgwick continued to appear in Warhol films such as Outer and Inner Space, Prison, Lupe, and Chelsea Girls. The edited footage of Sedgwick and Chelsea Girls would eventually become the film Afternoon. Lupe is often thought to be Sedgwick's last Warhol film, but she filmed the Andy Warhol story with Rene Ricard in November 1966, almost a year after finishing Lupe. Sedgwick's filmography is still not entirely understood due to, due to the amount of editing that occurred with her bits. The, Andor, the Andy Warhol story was an unreleased film that was only scream, screened once at the factory. Along with Sedgwick, the film featured Ricard pretending to be Andy Warhol. I think Edie was something Andy would like to have been. He was transposing himself into her a la Pygmalion, mused Truman Capote. Andy Warhol would like to have been Edie Sedgwick. He would like to have been a charming, well-born debutante from Boston. He would like to have been anybody except Andy Warhol. We know Andy Warhol had a death wish, which he discussed in his interview with the young Jodie Foster for his magazine, Interview Magazine. He was teased for wanting to die by his long-time lover, and he also was eventually shot. Behind the scenes, however, Edie frequently turned to drugs. She liked speed balls or a shot of heroin in one arm and amphetamines in the other. The previously niche phrase superstar was popularized for Edie. She can be seen defining the term on the Merv Griffin show, indicating that the word was not a staple in the general public's vocabulary before her appearance on the show. Although Warhol and Edie were inseparable for a time, these two silver-haired twins, it took less than a year for things to fall apart. Sedgwick began to lose faith in Warhol as early as the summer of 1965, complaining these movies are making a complete fool out of me. Their relationship deteriorated by late 1965 over a dinner, with Edie crying that he had humiliated her, and Sedgwick demanded that Warhol stop showing her films. Supposedly, she left this dinner with Bob Dylan. I hate Bob Dylan, and so no photos of him will appear in this presentation. Edie Sedgwick and Bob Dylan's romance was kept secret, but the singer allegedly wrote a number of songs about her, including Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat, Just Like a Woman, and Fourth Time Around from his 1966 album Blonde on Blonde. Eddie also appears in the music of The Velvet Underground, Drama Rama, The Cult, The Pretty Reckless, and Lady Gaga. Edie's brother Jonathan claimed that Edie did fall for the folk singer hard. She called me up and said she'd met this folk singer in Chelsea and she thinks she's falling in love, he said. I could tell the difference in her just from her voice. She sounded so joyful instead of sad. It was later on she told me she'd fallen in love with Bob Dylan. Jonathan claimed that Edie also got pregnant by Dylan and that doctors and Dylan forced her to have an abortion. Her biggest joy was with Bob Dylan and her saddest time was with Bob Dylan, losing the child, Jonathan said. Edie was changed by that experience, very much so. I try to get close to Andy, but I can't, Edie confided in a friend as their partnership deteriorated when she spent more time with Dylan. Sedgwick was living at the Chelsea Hotel. Dylan and his friends eventually convinced Sedgwick to sign up with Albert Grossman, Dylan's manager. According to Paul Morrissey, Sedgwick had developed a severe crush on Dylan that she thought he reciprocated. She was also under the impression that Dylan would help her film career and they would star in a mainstream film together. Unbeknownst to Sedgwick, Dylan had secretly married his girlfriend, Sarah Lowndes, in November 1965. Morrissey claimed that Sedgwick was informed of the marriage by Warhol, who reportedly heard about it through his lawyer in, no in February 1966. Friends of Sedgwick's later said that she saw the supposed offer of doing a film with Dylan as a ticket to more lucrative jobs. Paul Morrissey claimed 
that Dylan likely never had plans to star in a film with Sedgwick and used and gave her this information just to use her and Dylan hadn't been very truthful. Since Sedgwick's death, Bob Dylan has repeatedly denied that he ever had a romantic relationship with her, despite reminiscences of these friends and photographs of them together, but he did acknowledge knowing her. In December 2006, several weeks before the release of the film Factory Girl, the Weinstein Company and the film's producers interviewed Sedgwick's older brother, Jonathan who repeated his claims about the baby aborted by Sedgwick that was Dylan's. As a result of the accident, doctors consigned Edie to a mental hospital where she was treated for drug addiction. So Sedgwick's brother claimed that in this hospital, staff found she was pregnant, but fearing the baby had been damaged by her drug use and anorexia forced her to have the abortion. In 1965, Sedgwick started a relationship with Dylan's good friend, folk musician Bobby Newworth, which Dylan encouraged. Some commented Dylan was trying to pimp Edie out, but it couldn't fill the gaping chasm that had opened up inside of her. I was like a sex slave to Bobby Newworth, Edie said. I could make love for 48 hours, but without getting tired. But the moment he left me alone, I felt so empty and lost that I would start popping pills. In 1966, Sedgwick was named one of the fashion revolutionaries in New York by Women's Wear Daily. Edie's downward spiral didn't go unnoticed. In her final movie with Warhol, the artist gave one chilling direction. I want something where Edie commits suicide at the end. And to a friend, Warhol, Warhol asked, do you think Edie will let us film her when she commits suicide? Although the magazine's editor-in-chief, Di Diana Vreeland of Vogue, dubbed Sedgwick a youth quake, Sedgwick's excessive use of drugs in 1966 stopped her from becoming a part of the Vogue family. She was identified in the gossip columns with the drug scene, and back then there was a certain apprehension about being involved in that scene, said senior editor Gloria Schiff. Drugs had done so much damage to young, creative, brilliant people that we were just anti that scene as a policy. Edie auditioned for Norman Mailer when the stage adaptation of his novel, The Deer Park, was being produced, but Mailer turned her down. She was very good in a sort of tortured and wholly sensitive way. She used so much of herself with every line that we knew she'd be immolated after three performances. After living in the Chelsea Hotel for months, she went home for Christmas in 1966. Her brother Jonathan recalled her behavior back at the ranch as strange and alien-like. She'd pick up what you were about to say before you'd say it. It made everyone uncomfortable. She wanted to sing, and so she would sing, but it was a drag because it wasn't in tune. Unable to handle her drug habit and maybe just not liking her that much, Newworth left Edie in early 1967. In March of that same year, she started to film a semi-autobiographical film called Chow Manhattan. During this, she accidentally set her room on fire in the Chelsea Hotel and was briefly hospitalized with burns. She was hospitalized again in the summer of 1970, but was let out under the supervision of a psychiatrist, two nurses, and the live-in care of filmmaker John Palmer and his wife, Janet. Determined to finish Chow, Chow Manhattan and have her story told, she reconnected with the film crew and began shooting in Arcadia and Santa Barbara, California in late 1970. She also recorded audio tapes reflecting on her life story and discussing her mental struggles after having abortions and being treated badly by men, accounts Wiseman and Palmer incorporated into Chow Manhattan's dramatic art. Filming completed in early 1971, and the film was released in 1972. You can watch portions of it on YouTube. By this point, Edie had gone through several more mental institutions. Though she was struggling, she still exuded the same charming energy that had so enticed Dylan and Warhol. In August 1969, she had been hospitalized in the psychiatric ward of the Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital after being arrested for drug offenses by the local police. In 1970, she fell in love with a fellow patient, Michael Post, 
who aptly organized the mail for the mental institution and married him on July 24th, 1971. During this time, she gave up drugs and alcohol, but a few months later in October 1971, she relapsed after taking prescription pain medication given to her for a physical illness, which in turn led to abusing barbiturates and alcohol. On the night of November 15, 1971, Sedgwick went to a fashion show at the Santa Barbara Museum that included a segment filmed for the television show An American Family. After the fashion show, she attended a party where she drank alcohol. She then phoned her husband to pick her up. On the way home, Sedgwick expressed thoughts of uncertainty about their marriage. Before they both fell asleep, Post gave Sedgwick the medication that had been prescribed for her. According to Post, Sedgwick started to fall asleep very quickly and her breathing was bad. It sounded like there was a big hole in her lungs, but he attributed this to her smoking and went to sleep. Just like her stunning rise, Eddie's fall came suddenly. On November 16th, Post woke up to find his wife dead beside him. She had died from an apparent barbiturates overdose. The coroner ruled her death as undetermined slash accident slash suicide. Sedgwick was not buried in her family's Massachusetts Sedgwick Pie Cemetery plot, but in the small Oak Hill Cemetery in Ballard, California. Edie had lived a short life, but she lived it with all her heart. Despite her demons and the weight of her past, she found herself in the nexus of New York culture, the muse to not one, but two well-known artists of the 20th century. Her sister, Alice Sedgwick Wool, in her own book, insists that Edie was not a victim. What destroyed Edie were all the forces that made it inevitable that she would destroy herself. She was neither a passive source of inspiration nor a covert careerist, but more than a muse who understood that the self was the next great art form. I'm in love with everyone I've ever met in one way or another, she once said. I'm just a crazy, unhinged disaster of a human being. But greed wasn't done with Edie Sedgwick after her death. Actor Warren Beatty bought the light, the rights to Sedgwick's life story in the 1980s and planned to make a movie, initially with Molly Ringwald, then with Jennifer Jason Leigh as Sedgwick. Al Pacino was tapped to play Warhol. Neither was these film, this film was never produced, but Beatty still holds the life rights, which causes, you know, difficulty for other artists who are inspired by Edie Sedgwick. I also personally think it's one of the factors where we see Edie's sibling speaking out because her life rights are held by this other person who's not a relative. Sienna Miller played Sedgwick in the film Factory Girl, a fictional, fictionalized account of Sedgwick's life released in December 2006. The film portrays Warhol as a cynic who leads Sedgwick into a downward spiral of drug addiction and psychiatric problems. There's also a conglomeration of various characters in a lookalike of Bob Dylan. As of late 2006, Dylan was apparently threatening to pursue a defamation lawsuit, claiming the film implicates him as having driven Sedgwick to her death. Again, he also claims that they were never lovers, so it's really not clear what Dylan's position is on Sedgwick. In 2019, Judge Donna Geck issued a court ruling resolving a long festering legal fight as to who can and can't capitalize on Edie Sedgwick's publicity rights. The parties were Michael Brett Post, the postal worker who met Sedgwick at the psych ward of Cottage Hospital and was married to her for three months. In 1989, Post filed legal papers asserting his rights to market his ex-wife's likeness. Opposing Post was filmmaker David Weissman, to whom Sedgwick had signed away all publicity rights just for one film, and that film was Chow Manhattan. Geck's ruling hinged on a narrow legal question. Was Edie famous before or after she died? Was she what's known in the eyes of the law a deceased personality? Weissman, who would later make the critically acclaimed Kiss of the Spider Woman, argued via attorney that Sedgwick's commercially exploitable fame derived only from her appearance in his film, Chow Manhattan 
which first screened eight months after her death. Ignoring the 18 movies she had made prior, her fashion, her modeling, and her other creative output. output. Geck, erroneously in my opinion, would conclude Edie Sedgwick had not achieved the exalted status of being a personality at the time she became deceased, despite her recognition as a superstar and pop icon by multiple mainstream media figures before she died. All Sedgwick's publicity rights, she ruled, had been signed over to Weissman. We can see that Weissman doesn't hesitate to wear Edie Sedgwick t-shirts at public appearances where it appears the young girl has something over her mouth, which is apt considering Weissman refuses to share any sort of what he sees as his property, Edie Sedgwick. Edie Sedgwick continues to inspire people today. While she could not be quote unquote saved, she remains this tragic heroine caught in a world I don't think she entirely understood. I think it's clear that multiple men abused not only her, but also her image. And I'm hoping that a greater audience can recognize Edie Sedgwick as a bastion of an old American family, harboring feelings of old Americans that weren't recognized in New York City and the modern 1960s world.